So a lot of people have been actually reaching out to me and actually wanting me to do a video on the newborn examination and the newborn history. It took me a while, but finally put this presentation together. I really hope you enjoy it. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where I look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at newborn history and physical examination. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Apologies for my voice, I am coming down with a cold that's actually really, really nasty. So grab a piece of paper, let's start. Before we actually get into this lecture, a very special thanks to actually Learn Pediatrics module. I added a lot of their content in this and it was a video done by Dr. Glenn Robertson, Dr. Morris Harley, Dr. Anne, Dr. Elmine, Dr. Jeff, Dr. Andrew, Ian, as well as Craig, as well as Wendy, and as well as the Department of Pediatrics. So pretty much special thanks to them. I used a lot of their content in this to make this presentation possible. So it's not my work. It's not uh, captured in any local hospital here. I hope to actually capture some local videos and actually do some videos with local content, but in the near future. So remember that all newborns must actually be examined fully within 24 hours of birth and at discharge. These examinations must actually be continuous at specific intervals to look out for certain abnormalities, to look out for certain defects. And remember that often these newborns that are going to be admitted to the NICU, which is what we're going to be focusing mainly on, are pretty much going to be brought from the labor ward or they're going to be brought from theater. So they'll come in with a referral form that's going to be containing the details of the neonate as well as the details of the mother, what was done to the neonate before the neonate was actually brought to the NICU for admission. A lot was done to the, 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 the neonate pretty much and any details of the mother that are really significant. And remember that at the time when you're actually admitting this child to the NICU, the mother may not necessarily be there in the NICU and may only actually be there in the subsequent days. So I will do a full history of uh, how to take history taking in a NICU when you're interviewing the mothers. But this one is pretty much just on day one of life. How are you going to document the findings? How are you going to take a history? I'll give you a case study at the end of this video to help you actually see how exactly we document these things. So remember that you're going to recording to, to be recording all these details in the patient file or the neonate file. And remember that all neonates that are born at the hospital are often admitted to our NICU. And those that and these are often those that have indications to be admitted to the NICU, of which are many if they're born prematurely if they have low birth weight, if they are macrosomic, if they have respiratory distress, if they needed to be resuscitated and there's need for further assessment before they can actually be discharged to go home, we admit them to the NICU. But anyone who's discharged and they come back to the hospital with a neonate that's ill, we never admit them to the same NICU as those infants that are born and never leave the hospital. Why? Because those that have already left the hospital may come in with other bugs that may not necessarily be the ones that are around the hospital so they can actually infect and contaminate the entire NICU. So there's actually a protocol of how this is actually done. We'll discuss that in another video. So this is how we take the history in NICU. It's very simple. So you want to record your neonatal uh, details. So the reason why this neonate was referred, the gender of this neonate, the date of birth, the time, the weight, the gestational age, the APCA score. I'll look at what APCA score is very shortly for those that already don't know and for those that know it will just be merely revision then the condition of the baby since birth are they feeding have they passed urine have they passed meconium of course this may not necessarily be recorded on your referral form from the labor order from theater and of course the resuscitation details what was done for this baby any medications that were given record all that then record the maternal details which are often seen on the referral form What's the parity? What's the age? What's the residence? Any blood results? HIV status, syphilis status, the RPR, uh, the surface antigen status, that's for hepatitis B, and the blood grouping. 
we often do HIV commonly. RPR, I've seen it common, but not so much. Surface antigen, it's once in a while that I see it being done. And then what is the mode of delivery? Any significant antenatal history, any illnesses or anything else that must have been significant during the pregnancy or in the interpartum period. So remember that APCA score is just simply a scoring system that is going to be looking at certain parameters to assess the need of resuscitation of a child. It doesn't really predict the overall outcome of the child. It just tells you that this child needs resuscitative measures. They may need stimulation. They may need suctioning. They may need ventilation. So it's a scoring system that's done at birth, at one minute, and then at five minutes. And then if the APCA score is less than nine at five minutes, you do it at five minute intervals until the score is actually nine and the, the child is stable. So what are these parameters? You can use the word APCA to remind you. So A for activity or muscle tone. If the child is active and spontaneously moving, give them two points. If they are flexed arms and legs, one point. If there's no activity, it's absent, zero. Then the pulse, if it's above 100, two points. If it's below 100, one point. If it's absent, zero. The grimace or the reflex irritability, if there's prominent response to stimulation, you give them two points. If there's minimal response to stimulation, one point. If they are floppy, we give them no points at all. Then the appearance, that's the skin color. If they are pink all over, two points. If they have a pink body with blue extremities, one point. If they are blue or pale, zero points. Then the respiration. If there's a vigorous cry, we give them two points. If there's slow and irregular uh, respirations, we give them one point. If there is no respiration, we give them zero points. And of course, we record the score out of 10. The higher the score, the better it is for this infant. So like I said, if the APCA score is at five minutes, is less than five, then assessments should be done at five minute intervals alongside resuscitative measures. And once the child is stable, the systemic examination can begin or they can be taken to the NICU. Often, this APCA score is going to be done immediately at birth and these resuscitative measures are going to be done in either in theater where the child was born via C-section or in labor ward if they're born via a spontaneous vaginal delivery. So what are some of the pre preliminaries that you really need to know? Remember that you must expose the child completely and examine the child completely. You should ensure that the surrounding temperature is ambient, but of course, if you can't really control the temperature of the room, you should make sure that the neonate is placed on an examination table that has a built-in warmer to keep the, the neonate warm. Otherwise, you must examine this neonate as quickly as possible because you always want to prevent hypothermia. And if the neonate is actually asleep and relaxed, you may actually proceed to auscultate the heart first and then palpate the abdomen before you actually proceed. Uh, actually, before you actually proceed to actually other uh, examinations that are disturbing, such as examination of the oral cavity as well as examination of the hips. So, how are we going to examine this newborn? So, we use a head-to-toe approach, and when you use this approach, make sure that you are quick and you are thorough, so that you do not miss anything. So like how I like to actually examine the newborns, I like to first start to look at my vitals and my measurements. The measurement that we usually just do is the weight. We don't usually measure the crown to heel length. We don't usually measure the head circumference, but that should be measured. Then the vitals, which are going to be including blood pressure, temperature, oxygen saturation, and the random blood sugar. We don't commonly check for the blood pressure. Then we do a general examination, examination of the head, face, neck, and shoulders, examination of the chest and cardiovascular system, examination of the abdomen, examination of the genitals and the rectum. We do a musculoskeletal and spine examination. We do a neurologic examination, and we may do additional scoring systems to actually assess certain things. For example, we may do a ballot score in prematurity. We may do a Thompson uh, Holland, uh, actually not even Thompson Holland, sorry, I'm thinking of something else. So Thompson HIE score, for example, in HIE. Then we'll begin with vitals and measurements. So we do take the temperature. Remember that axillary temperature normally should be 36.5 to 37.5. Rectal 36.6 to 38. The ear 35.8 to 38. Oral 35.5 to 37.5. So anything lower than 35, we are going to be terming that as hypothermia. Anything above 38, we're going to be terming that as hyperthermia. Then we check the pulse or the heart rate, which can be used with your pulse oximetry at the same time. 
So it should be between 100 to 160 beats per minute. Less than 100, they are bradycardic. Uh, greater than 160, they are tachycardic. Then we also look at the respiratory rate. It should be between 30 to 60 breaths per minute. If it's greater than 60 breaths per minute, they are tachypnic, and this could be a feature of respiratory distress. Very common, especially in transient tachypnea of the newborn, very common in respiratory distress syndrome. Then you also want to check your oxygen saturation. These actually may fluctuate in the very first days of life, between 60 to 90%, but generally they should be above 90%. If the saturations are not so good, try administering oxygen. If the oxygen improves, continue the chart on the oxygen and you may win them, on, win them off later on. But if they don't significantly improve, you may escalate with CPAP, you may escalate with other modes of ventilation, which we discussed in a video that I'll leave tagged at the end. But if the saturations don't improve, then you have to assess the chart for any cardiovascular abnormalities or congenital heart disease. Then you also want to check our random blood sugar. Very important in all newborns, we routinely check this. So generally, the sugar should be greater than 2.6 millimoles, but we don't actually even allow it to reach 2.6. In our setting, we use a threshold of 3. So the blood sugar should be at least greater than 3. Anything lower than 3, you must bonus this child with dextrose. Then the blood pressure is not routinely done unless if it's a very sick neonate or infant or if there's a, actually an indication for you to actually measure the BP. But if you do, the systolic bl blood pressure is between 65 to 90 millimeters of mercury. The diastolic blood pressure is 45 to 65. And like I said, we measure the weight. We do the crown to heel length as well as the head circumference. We don't routinely do these last two in our setting. Then we come on to the general examination. We look at the general appearance of the child. So is the child active? Are there any obvious malformations that you can see? Things like dysmorphic faces or any limb abnormalities. I'll show you some of these dysmorphic features as we go on with this lecture. Is the baby crying? And is the cry normal? Is it high pitched? Can you barely hear the cry? If the child is sleeping, you can actually arouse the child back, gently flicking the sole of the uh, foot or even just touching the corner of the mouth with tactile stimulus and the child may actually arouse and uh, begin to cry. So you should note any grunting that is present that may suggest any respiratory distress. Unfortunately, I didn't add a sound on grunting in this video, so you can just actually do a YouTube search to look uh, for what grunting actually sounds like. Then you look for the color of the baby. Is the baby pink all over? Are they cyanosed? Meaning are they appearing bluish? Are they appearing pale? Are they jaundiced? Are they plethoric? Are they appearing like extremely red? Then we perform the skin examination afterwards. So this is what a cyanosed uh, child is going to be looking like, especially the extremities. As you can see, they're appearing blue here. Here we have the arms and the legs. Uh, acrocyanosis. This is very common in newborns. Usually as time goes on, as you put them on oxygen, the cyanosis will wear off or as the day goes by or the days go by, the cyanosis wears off. You are mainly concerned if the entire baby is actually quite cyanosed. So you have two main types of cyanosis. I know I'll discuss four different types of cyanosis, but two main types of cyanosis that you're looking out for. Peripheral cyanosis here, which is often, I can say quote unquote, uh, a common thing that you may see, then central cyanosis may be indicative of other things that may need further investigation, such as congenital heart defects. So as you can see, the mouth of this child is appearing bluish. So like I say, the four different types of cyanosis that I'll discuss. So we have central cyanosis, which I showed you a picture of in the previous slide, the mouth area, peripheral cyanosis with the extremities, then you may have differential cyanosis and reversed differential cyanosis. So with central cyanosis, we have a blue tongue, the lips, and the warm peripheries. This is often indicative of con a congenital heart uh, disease. It's often indicative of congestive heart failure. It's often indicative of lung disease. Then you have peripheral cyanosis, which has these extremities that are blue and cold. This is often indicative of a hypovolemic shock and even a low cardiac output. Then you may have differential cyanosis where the lower limbs are cyanosed, but the upper limbs are pink. This is uh, indicative in the PDA with reversed shunts, then especially with uh, pulmonary hypertension. Then with reversed differential cyanosis where the upper limbs are cyanosed, greater than the lower limbs, this may be indicative of transposition of the great vessels. So those are the four types of cyanosis, but I just want you to worry much about central cyanosis and peripheral cyanosis. So remember that acrocyanosis is a normal thing for newborns. Like I said, if there is a general cyanosis observed, the response to oxygen administration 
uh, as well as what happens with the baby crying, you should note these things, observe these things. And then in the absence of cardiac disease, the infant actually should become pink over time and you can actually give them positive pressure ventilation if they need be, that's the CPAP, and they will become pink over time. So you also look for jaundice, which is yellowish discoloration of the skin, as you can see in this image over there. Then we move on to examination of the skin. Remember where we're coming from? We were looking at the pretty much the general condition or the general appearance of the child. We looked at the vitals, then we're coming now to the skin. So on the skin, when the infant is delivered, they're often covered in this whitish cheesy material, which is known as vernix caseosa, which is what is depicted in this image above. So this is completely normal. Then they may sometimes have these papules, which are whitish in color, that are often on the face. Sometimes they may be quite extensive. These are just simply keratin-filled epithelial cysts. They, it's what we refer to as milia, which is what is depicted on the bottom image here. This may be normal. It may actually resolve spontaneously. The other thing that you're going to be looking for on the skin when you're examining the skin of this infant or this neonate is you may look for birthmarks, you may look for certain other things such as slate gray patches or nevi, we call these as Mongolian spots. They're very common on the lumbar region, they're very common on the buttocks. They are usually seen in individuals that are darker and over time they actually become less obvious and they're actually completely normal. There is no underlying pathology. You may see other birthmarks such as hemangioma, salmon patches, cafe or lay spots, and these are usually normal if they're isolated and minimal, but if you have a large uh, number of them and if they are numerous, then you may want to consult dermatology because there may be an underlying condition. You also want to note for any particular or any bruising of the face or the skin which may indicate a traumatic delivery. Remember these children are at a higher risk of neonatal jaundice. And also note for any thin hairs that may be seen over the face, over the back, the neck, that we call this as lanugo. It's very common in premature children. So this is what the cafe au lait spots look like. And this is a, a, a French word. Um, au lait is, means this is like um, coffee and milk, if I'm not mistaken. Then, of course, this is a salmon patch. All these are completely normal. Then here is what Lanugo looks like. These are fine, soft hair, especially that cover the body and the limbs, especially of a premature child. Then we come now to examination of the head. We're done with the general examination. We did the general appearance, we checked the if the child is pale, if the child is cyanose, if the child is jaundiced, we examined the skin for any um, lanugo, we examined the skin for any birthmarks, we examined the skin for any milia, we examined the skin for uh, any other skin lesions that we've talked about previously. Then we move now to the head. You want to palpate the sutures. Remember, as the child is being born and passing through the birth canal, the bones may actually overlap, so this is actually normal, but as the child grows, they will normalize. We palpate the anterior and the posterior font now, and we must note if there's any head trauma. This may be evident by a caput succedaneum, which I will show you. This is just simply diffuse swelling, which often crosses the suture lines. And this is caused by pressure from the uterus or the vaginal ward during delivery. You must differentiate this from a cephalohematoma, which is bleeding into the periosteum that doesn't cross the suture lines. And this is often due to instrumental delivery, such as use of a vacuum cup or use of forceps delivery. So here's a video of how actually to palpate the suture. So I shall play it and I will be telling you what exactly is going on in the video. So... Pay attention, pay close attention. So as you can see there, uh, the doctor is palpating the coronal suture, palpating the sagittal suture, palpating the lambdoid suture over there, which is posteriorly. Those are the sutures that we have. Then she goes on to palpate the posterior and the anterior fontanelle. So she's palpating the posterior fontanelle over there, which is in that position, and the anterior fontanelle is what she began to palpate. So that's how we're going to be palpating. I'll play this one more time. So start off with palpating the anterior fontanelle, the coronal sutures. We come now to the sagittal sutures. We then palpate the lambdoid sutures. Then after that, we palpate the posterior fontanelle. 
and we can even come back and populate the anterior fontanelle. We should make sure that these fontanelles are actually level. They are not uh, bulging. They're not depressed. A depressed fontanelle may indicate a child that's dehydrated. A bulging fontanelle may indicate increased intracranial pressure, which would be in the background of certain infections, i.e. your neonatal sepsis, which may be presenting as a meningitis. Okay, so this is what a caput succedaneum actually looks like. As you can see, there's three pictures here is a caput succedaneum, this diffuse swelling that's seen um, often when the child is born. So all these are caput succedaneum over there. You may pause the video, take a screenshot of this. It may help you for future reference. And this is what a cephalohematoma looks like. As you can see, it does not cross the suture lines. Then you come and examine the eyes. After you examine the head, you move now to examine the eyes. So remember that the eyes are easily examined if the baby actually opens them spontaneously. We can actually do this by covering the eyes and covering the light from the eyes and the child will actually spontaneously open their eyes or when they're feeding. So often when they open their eyes, this is a time when you can actually examine the eyes by shining a light in them to elicit what is known as the red reflex. So when you sign an ophthalmological light, not the torches that you have from your phones that can actually blind someone, but when you shine the light, you can actually see this red reflection in the back of the eye. So this is a normal reflex. So if it's one eye and the other one is not showing the, the redness, then this is an absent red reflex. If it's showing whitish color, this may indicate other pathologies such as retinoblastomas. It may indicate cataracts. So here is uh, the examiner again, checking the eyes of this baby. So I will play this video. As you can see, they're covering there to open the eyes. Then they are going to attempt to shine the light into the uh, neonate's eyes. And then we are going to be checking for the red reflex. Like I said, if there is this whitish discoloration, this may be indicative of cataracts or other pathologies. So you may indicate intraocular pathologies with this uh, absent red reflex, such as cataracts, such as retinoblastoma. Then we examine the face. We look for dysmorphic features, such as a flat nasal bridge, facial asymmetry, epicanthal folds. So as you can see here, this child has a flat nasal bridge over there. Then this child has epicanthal folds, these folds here at the medial aspects of the palpebral fissures. And note also this child has what is known as a pseudostrabismus. As you can see, it's like one eye of the child is actually misaligned, when in true essence, it's actually not. It's very different from strabismus, where they actually are misaligned. Then we should also examine the nose to check if the, the nasal cavities are patent. Now, you want to check for what is known as coanal atresia. How do we check for this? First of all, you should observe the infant. The infant should be able to breathe with their mouth closed. Remember that uh, neonates are actually able to, they're what we call obligate nose breathers. So they're able to breathe with their nose only up until the age of four months when they actually do learn, quote unquote, to breathe with their mouth as well. So what you can actually simply do is observe the child. If the child is able to breathe with their mouth closed, then you can assume that the nasal uh, cavities are patent or the nostrils are patent. Then you can proceed to occlude one nostril and see if the infant is breathing from the other nostril, then alternate and close the other nostril to check if the infant is breathing from the other nostril. So I'll play the video and I will show you how exactly it is done. So again, you're observing the child if they're breathing, we cover the left nostril to see if they're breathing through the right nostril, we cover the other nostril to see if they're breathing with the other nostril. And that's how we actually are performing the exam. Then we move on to check the ears. Remember, we're going to be checking for the placement of the ears. We're going to be checking for the shape. We're going to be checking for the elasticity of the ears. Remember that the ears, if you draw a line from the eyes uh, backwards, going to the ears, it must actually bisect the upper two thirds of the ears. If it doesn't, then it means that these ears are low set. But of course, this is rather subjective. So remember that if the child has unusual, unusual size of shape or even lacking cartilage in the ears, and especially if the ears are low placed, this is actually a very significant finding. It may actually be pointing you towards urinary tract abnormalities. For some reason, there is a link between the development of the ears and the urinary tract. So if you see these abnormalities, uh, you should actually send this child for further assessment 
of the renal system. Then we also do universal screening uh, of hearing, but of course this is not done routinely in our setting, but in other places they do this routine hearing screening for every infant. So this is how we're going to be checking the ears. As you can see, they can fold and they can actually spring back. The cartilage is there. We are normally placed. Then we move on to check the mouth. So remember that the mouth should be fully inspected with a good light and with a spatula. So you want to inspect the palate up until you reach the uvula to actually eliminate minor degrees of cleft palate. You can actually put your finger, you should put your finger inside also to actually rule out any high arched palate. At this moment in time, you can actually check for the rooting reflex and the sucking reflex, but others actually prefer to actually defer this to the end of the exam when they're doing the neurological exam. And I did actually put clips of that at the end in the neurological exam. So here is inspection of the mouth. So it should be with good light and a spatula, inspecting the uvula, uh, the palate up until the uvula, then put your finger in to actually check for any minor degrees of cleft palate or high arched palate. Then we move on to the neck and the shoulder. Remember that the stenocleidomastoid muscle should be palpated and you should actually the range of rotation of the head to each side must be checked to rule out any congenital torticollis. We should palpate the clavicles for any fractures. Then remember if you have a girl child that has webbing or redundant skin, this may indicate that there was some intrauterine lymphedema or it may be suggestive of Turner syndrome. So this is how you actually examine the neck. So you're palpating the sternocleidomastoid muscles. You rotate the head to each side to ensure that there is full range of motion in this infant and there is no restriction. Then you repeat with the other side to check if there is full range of motion. You palpate also the clavicles to see if there are any fractures. Then we come to now the chest. We're now done with the head and the neck. We now move to the chest. We palpate the chest and we inspect it to look for any asymmetry of the ribcage. And remember that you may sometimes notice some breast hypertrophy. This is very common in males and females because of the uh, transference of the maternal hormones from the mother to the neonate. And we should note any intercostal, suprasternal or subcostal recessions that may actually be indicative of respiratory distress. So here's a child that was admitted to our NICU. This is actually a locally taken video. I've actually blurred out the face in case the relatives are watching, kind of, I don't know. But here, as you can see, there is this sternal recession. And as you can see, as you can see, there is this intercostal uh, recessions that we have over there and this child is in some respiratory distress, even some suprasternal recessions are going to be uh, seen. So this is a child that's in respiratory distress. So we also listen to the chest to ensure there's equal air entry into both lung fields. Then if you hear any crackles, which are also known as rails, which are also known as crepitations, these may indicate infections. They may indicate respiratory distress syndrome or even transient tachypnea of the newborn, especially in babies that are born via C-section. And remember that these crackles often are going to be sounding like a person that is walking on leaves. I actually added a sound here. I really hope that you are able to hear the sound. So I'm going to play it for you. If it it doesn't work out in the post editing. I will add the sound in post editing, but this is what crepitations actually sound like. Okay, I really hope that actually recorded. If it didn't, then I'll add it to the post editing of this video. Then we should listen to the heart sounds and any murmurs on both the chest and the back. And remember that if you have any transient murmurs, these are actually quite common and they're benign. And most people actually assume that uh, murmurs are going to be pointing towards congenital heart defects. But sometimes congenital heart defects initially don't even present with, a, with any abnormal heart sounds. Okay, so 
here is examination of the chest as you can see we are palpating both sides to assure that there is symmetry of the chest then you're going to be uh, auscultating for any murmurs we will auscultate both lung fields to see if there's equal air entry we are hearing any abnormal sounds such as crepitations that may indicate infections that may indicate other pathologies especially respiratory distress syndrome and transient tachypnea of the newborn and then of course we actually listen to the heart sounds for any murmurs that may be heard or may be present then we move on to palpation of the pulses we want to make sure that we palpate the brachial pulse as well as the femoral pulse you must compare the brachial pulse to the femoral pulse note the volume note the timing if there is any delay between these two pulses this may indicate a left-sided heart lesion it may also indicate coarctation of the aorta and remember that you should also palpate both femoral pulses it's sometimes quite difficult to find the femoral pulse and it actually takes quite some practice actually to find it but you should apply some gentle pressure over the inguinal region so here in the video palpation of the brachial pulse as well as palpation of the femoral pulse over there then you have palpation of the femoral pulses which may take a bit of some practice to actually get a hang of then we move now to examination of the abdomen we must inspect the abdomen for any obvious defects remember we should inspect the umbilical cord normally there should be two arteries and uh, a vein so it's like a it's like a face i can say these are the two eyes and the mouth that's how i remember it in my head two arteries and a vein so if there's a variation with this you must actually send this out for prompt investigation do a renal ultrasound and remember this umbilical cord must be clean it must be clamped it must be dry and there shouldn't be any active bleeding as the child goes further and further into the days of life it dries up and it will eventually fall off but generally the mother must be cleaning it each and every single day to prevent it from being infected and we also have to note that the abdominal wall is actually quite weak so you, especially in premature infants you may actually note diastasis recti you may note umbilical hernia so they're not quite uncommon for you to not see them then if you see a scaphoid abdomen this may be suggestive of a diaphragmatic hernia on the other hand if it's distended this may be suggestive of obstruction which is often due to meconium ileus but you should also keep in the back of your mind necrotizing enterocolitis then you want to palpate for the internal organs normally the liver is going to be palpable about two centimeters below the costal margin less commonly the spleen the tip of the spleen may be felt the kidneys may sometimes be palatable, especially the right kidney on deep palpation so this is how you do it so here we're palpating for the liver and then on the other side we're palpating for the spleen remember that the liver is on the right side the spleen is on the left side then we're trying to ballot the kidneys over there then the next is the genitalia before I actually go to the genitalia viewer discretion is advised um, so remember that we want to inspect that the infant does not have ambiguous genitalia where you're not so sure if this is female or male in a newborn female the labia majora are going to be prominent there is sometimes a non purulent discharge which is a normal phenomenon you may get this whitish or pinkish sometimes it looks like blood that may come out from that area and this is often due to maternal hormone transference actually it reminds me of a case that i dealt with when i was on call on one one of these fine days where a mother came in and the mother was actually complaining that the child is actually bleeding from that area and then i asked the mother any trauma then she, she refused i asked her if it was the first child she said yes and actually explained to her that it's actually a normal thing it's the hormones that are coming from your body that are going to the infant all you just have to do is just wash it with water you only should get worried if the bleeding gets uh intense or it becomes quite significant or if there's any prolonged discharge and of course we should ensure that there is no clitoral megaly which is enlargement of the clitoris beyond one centimeters 
Then on the other hand, in the male infants, the scrotum is going to be relatively large. Both testes should be descended into the scrotum. Some children may have undescended testes, which is cryptochidism. Then any scrotal swellings may be indicated may be indicative of a hydrocele or presence of an inguinal hernia. You should also note the rugae of the testes, which are the foldings of the testes. You should also note the median wrath, which is the middle line in the testes. Then, of course, the penile length of less than 2.5 is going to be indicative of a micropenis. The prepuce is normally tight and adherent, and normally you get an erection in the penis. Sometimes in neonates, it's quite common, and it's actually of no significance. And within 12 hours, more than 95% of the infants must pass urine. Then, of course, uh, most of them must pass meconium within the first 24 hours of life. If they don't beyond this, then this warrants for further investigation. You should also check that the anus of the child is actually in the normal position and it's patent. And remember that sometimes you may have an imperforate anus, which may be difficult sometimes to visualize. So you may actually uh, prove this by actually gently inserting your little finger or even using a rectal tube to try and insert it into the rectum to see if the rectum is patent. So here's the examination. So on the left here is examination of the female genitalia. As we can see, the labia majora are prominent. They're covering the labia minora. And that's examination of the female uh, newborn. Okay. Then on the other hand, uh, of course, the scrotum is quite large inside the males. You palpate the testes to see if both of them are descended into the sac. So you're palpating on the right side, then palpate on the left side. And of course, if there's any swelling, this may indicate of hydrocele, it may indicate inguinal hernias. And of course, note the rugae. You should also note the median wrath that is there on the testes of the child. Okay, there she goes on to check the patency of the anus. As you can see, the position of the anus. Or you can actually insert your little finger. You can also insert a rectal tube. Then you may sometimes note a sacral dimple, which is caused by irregularity of the skin fold. It's often present in the sacrococcygeal midline and should not actually be confused with the mucocutaneous, or neural rather, neurocutaneous sinus, which is in conditions like your spina bifida, your neurotube defects. So concerning features that you should look out for that may indicate of these neurocutaneous sinuses, for example, if you have a dimple that is higher than the back, uh, higher on the back than the tip of the sacrum, as we see in the image here on top, if you have hair that's overlying this dimple, as we see over here, and of course, if you have an obvious visualization of a fluid-filled meningocil, this may actually be indicative of these neurocutaneous sinuses. Then we move on to the musculoskeletal system. Deformities are often going to be due to the way the fetus actually was positioned intrauterine as well as uh, due to certain trauma or even delivery itself that may have caused the trauma. Remember that the infant must be spontaneously moving this extremity symmetrically and absence of this may actually indicate nerve damage, it may indicate fractured bones, it may also indicate an acutely ill infant. And of course, examine the hands and the feet for polydactyly, syndactyly, as well as a single palmar crease. You should also examine the feet for talipase equinovirus, which is clubbed foot. And you should also note uh, the sandal gap. A wide first sandal gap is going to be indicative of Down syndrome. So here are all these features that are being shown. So there the neonate is actually moving the limbs spontaneously or examining for any talipase equinovirus. Then, as you can see, spontaneous movement of the limbs. Okay, so that is polydactyly, that is syndactyly where the toes are actually fused. There we have a single palmar crease. And we also note the wide sandal gap if there is any first sandal gap 
uh, of course, this is Talipay is a queen of Iris. And note the white sandal gap if it is present. Okay. I think I may have skipped one image for you guys, the polydactyly. Let me just scroll back so that I can get to it. Okay, should be here. I didn't pause it at the right moment. Oops. Sorry again. We move back. Okay. So it should be somewhere here. Okay, so polydactyly, as you can see, there's this extra digit over there. So I hope this image is now clear. Then we should examine the joints and the bones. We should move the hip joint, the shoulder joint, the ankle joint, the elbow joint in all ranges of motion, palpate for any fractures in these bones, and note any tenderness if the child is crying excruciatingly when you palpate these joints. Then we should examine the spine. So we examine the spine if there is no evidence of scoliosis. We can actually run down a finger down the back of the neonate to actually examine for this. So this is how it's done. As simple as that. Then we move to the neurologic examination, which is the last part of this examination. So we observe the posture of the infant while as they're lying supine. Normally the normal posture is there should be flexion uh, at the hip, knee, and the elbow joints. And infants that are hypotonic, the baby may often assume a frog leg position where the hips are abducted with the thighs resting on the bed. So here is the normal position. As you can see, the elbow is flexed, the hips are flexed, the knees are flexed. This is the frog like position in infants with hypotonia. Then the level of alertness can be tested by tactile stimulation to the face or the foot, and this should actually awaken the baby. So as you can see, this tactile stimulation there is going to awaken this baby, and then the baby begins to cry. So you can see the baby has begun to cry. So this baby is arousable. Then we can check the tone by actually suspending the infant in the ventral position. In a normal baby with normal tone, the back should actually show some resistance to gravity as is shown in this image over there when the child is inverted into the ventral position. Then we should also check for certain reflexes. We have the plantar reflex, the sucking reflex, the molar reflex, the gallant reflex, as well as the grasping reflex. I will play you a video here of how you check for these reflexes with the plantar reflex, like as pressure applied to the uh, dorsum, that's the sucking reflex, where you put your little finger into the mouth of the neonate, of course, with a glove. Then when you attempt to like lower the head of the infant uh, quickly, you see like they will have this uh, response, like as if they're falling, you call that as the moral reflex. And of course, this is the gallant reflex when you rub your, um, you run your finger down the back of the infant, it appears like as if they're dancing, as you can see here. It's dancing like motion. Then this is of course the grasping reflex when they grasp onto your palms, or to your hands rather. So here's a case example to end this video of a patient, a theoretical patient that we had. So let me just zoom there. So uh, like when you're taking all your notes, make sure that you ensure that you have your date, the place where you're taking this and the time. Of course, your name at the uh, top there, you have your patient seen, day one of life, referred from labor ward for severe birth asphyxia. Excuse my handwriting, please. So then your natal details, the date of birth was the 23rd of March, the time of birth, 1845. The gender was male, birth weight was 2.8. The gestational age was 35 a week, six days by scan. The APCA score was five out of 10, six out of 10, six out of 10, nine out of 10. So the interventions that were done, suctioning, ample bag ventilation, and the child was put on O2 via nasal prong. Medication that was given, vitamin K, one milligram IM. The maternal de details, the mother is now para three. The age is 32. Residence is, lives in Ngombe. The RVD status, she's non-reactive. She's not HIV positive. Uh, RPR is non-reactive, so she does not have syphilis. The surface antigen wasn't really done. Mode of delivery, spontaneous vaginal delivery. Antenatal history, she had severe preeclampsia. Vitals are as follows. Pulse 130. 
respiration 50, SpO2 92 on 2 liters per minute, the weight was 2.8, temperature was 35.6, RBS was 5.2. On examination, this child was sleeping but arousable, not pale, not jaundiced, not cyanosed, pink extremities, level anterior fontanelle, moist mucous membranes, no subcostal recessions or intercostal recessions, not in any respiratory distress. The chest was symmetrical, equal air entry bilaterally, no added sounds, the CVS, the child was well perfused, full volume pulses, which were regular, um, S1, S2 were normal and heard, no added heart sounds, the abdomen was soft, non-tender, not distended, the umbilical stump was clean, dry, not actively bleeding, there was no organomegaly with a patent anus. On examination of the genitalia, the median raft was seen, the testes were present in the sac. And of course, on examination of the musculoskeletal system, no rash, no petechiae, no edema. We, of course, noted some lanugo. Then on examination of the CNS, the child was hypertonic with a poor sucking and grasping reflex, absent moral and plantar reflex. So an impression of HIE1, secondary to breath asphyxia was done, was made. And then, of course, we do our Thompson HIE score, which I didn't do here, which we'll discuss in another lecture. Our plan was that we're going to give our total fluid intake at two-thirds of the daily fluid intake, which is at 60 mils per kg per day. So 60 mils multiplied by 2.8, that gives us 168. Two-thirds of that gives us 112 mils. And of course, if we give it 8 hourly, we're going to give 37 mils 8 hourly of D10. We give our expen at 280,000 international units IVBD, gentamicin at 7 milligrams IVOD, we keep them on O2 via nasal prongs at 2 liters per minute, RBS profile 2 hourly, we monitor the vitals hourly, we do a fit chart, and of course we admit the child. So this is an, a case study example of how everything that I've discussed is going to be put into perspective. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notification of such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Sorry for the very long lecture, but it was very necessary. To Zambia and beyond, until next time, bye-bye.